Deepan Bhutakorti is an Ottawa-born construction worker and activist who has pitted an incredible battle against the conservative government over his entitlement to citizenship. Using its policy of double punishment, the government is attempting to deport him to his parents' homeland, India, a country where he has never lived and does not have citizenship. Deepan is currently traveling across Canada to tell his story and seek support. He will be speaking about his experiences in criminal prison and immigration detention and his current conditions as a stateless person. Deepan's struggle for recognition in this society is not just about him, it's about others who are affected by unjust immigration policies and practices which criminalize the racialized poor. It's about the way our society treats immigrant families, young men of color, and workers. Thank you, Deepan. Thank you. I'm just gonna start by saying thank you for coming out to this event. My name is uh, Deepan Bulakati, and I'm born in Canada. I have lived in Ottawa my whole life. I was born in, in Ottawa at Grace Hospital. I got in trouble with the law at age, at age 19. At age 19, I got charged for a transfer of a firearm. Once I got charged with a transfer of a firearm, I was put in OCDC, Ottawa Carlton Detention Center. I got into an altercation with a guard that I didn't agree with his per se his rule that he wanted to impose on me. I was thrown in the hole for 30 days. While I was thrown in the hole, a guard came up to me and asked me if I was a citizen or not. To my opinion, he's asking me this because of the fact that my appearance had a beard and I had puffy hair. I told him that I'm a Canadian citizen. Once I was released from the hole, CBSA came and seen me, stating that I'm not a citizen. I provided them a copy of my birth certificate and a Canadian passport. Anyone that provides a Canadian passport and a birth certificate, you would assume that they're a citizen right from there. But it didn't stop there. They came back telling me that my Canadian passport was giving me an air and my passport was taken away from me. I want to point out that there's no, there's no, there's no policy in effect where they, can, they don't screen individuals. The guard went out of his way to contact CBSA, in my opinion, and violated my privacy rights. Now, when they took away my Canadian passport, they're saying that after being in the country for 19 years, born in Canada, they took away my passport. Their justification to that is that they took it away, they gave it to me in error. Note that under the Passport Act, they cannot take away a passport away in error, but they took it away in error mine, directly violating my rights. They state that my parents had diplomatic status when I was born, but on contrary, my parents did not have diplomatic status, and I'm born on Canadian soil, therefore I'm a, born citizen, I'm a citizen of Canada. I contacted Divic Media while I was at Ottawa Carlton Detention Center by, by mail, by phone calls. The public safety minister got involved. Once the public safety minister got involved, my deportation was stopped. I also want to point out that the conditions at Ottawa College Detention Center, you're mixed with individuals that deal with criminal time as well as immigration. There's no, there's no mix. You're all put. So a guy could be coming off a plane trying to get seek refugee status, but thrown in jail with individuals that are dealing with whatever type of charges. You're locked down 21 hours a day. You're in a, depending on what unit you're on and what pod you're on, you could be three to a cell, four to a cell, or two to a cell. You're locked down 21 hours a day. The food that you get is very proportional. It doesn't matter if you're 300 pounds, six feet three, or it doesn't matter if you're four foot four, 110 pounds. You get the same amount of food. <coughs> healthcare, if you're dealing with immigration, you could go on the list for healthcare, but the chances that you're gonna see the doctor are very slim to none, in my opinion. Now, once I got sentenced to three years, eight months, I was transferred to Joyceville Penitentiary. At Joyceville Penitentiary, I was dealing with an admissibility hearing. At Joyceville, the jail should have been shut down, but they sent me to Joyceville. They did an ombudsman. I had to file different, different types of file. I had to file different ombudsman. It's like a complaint to the system saying that why am I at Joyceville and why am I on a range where you're locked down three, for three months at a time, or you're locked down for 30 days, you're locked down different things, because depending on what's happening, at the jail. I had an admissibility hearing. 
an admissibility hearing with the adjudicator. We're in a, you're in a room by 10 by 10 with your lawyer, the adjudicator, and yourself, and a CBSA officer. At this time, I provided, a multi, I provided documents, passport, birth certificate, testimony from my parents' employer at the time of my birth. A lot of my documents and evidence was thrown out because the adjudicator said that he doesn't have the proper authority to, to acknowledge the fact that this is the evidence that's brought forth to him. If this adjudicator had had a chance to actually look at all the documents instead of just reading the paper, I wouldn't be stateless. This, per, this adjudicator basically completely screwed my life. From this point on, I was released from Joyceville Penitentiary and I was transferred to Toronto West Detention Center. I want to point out that I should have gone back to Ottawa, where my family is, where my support is, where my lawyers are. But they decided to send me to Toronto. One of their tactics, they do the same thing with Lindsay and Toronto. They're sending individuals from Toronto to Lindsay. Reason why? To, to exclude them. Less, less visits from family, less chances of getting lawyers to come out there. It's exclusion tactic. I went to Toronto West Detention Center. At Toronto West Detention Center, You're on a range with 30 guys, three to a cell. You're in an L-shaped range with bars on the door. So if you want to use a washroom, you have two bed sheets that come in every two weeks. You gotta use your bed sheets to cover the grill and to cover behind you, because you're three guys to a cell. You're in, you're in a shape like this, so anyone on this side can see right across into your cell, so that's why you put the sheet on. You're not treated the same as individuals that are dealing with criminal. You're locked up earlier, Less privileges, less food, and more isolation. I want to point out that either at Joyceville Penitentiary, Lindsay, <coughs> Penitang, Ottawa College Tennis Center, and Toronto West, guards will attack you. There are blind spots. When I say by blind spots, there are certain sections of the hallway, there are certain places where there's no cameras. I had a personal experience where I had another issue at Toronto West where I would be, I, got, I came out of, the, out of the range, a guy put me against the wall and ch basically choked me out into the fact that I, got, I went to the hall right after. An individual cannot fight that back due to the fact that there's five guards there. You're dealing with immigration, you have no status, and you have criminal charges. Who are they going to believe? They're going to believe five guards or are they going to believe you? The guards itself, are like, in my opinion, are like, are like, it's like a gang in itself. They're their own unit that run the jail, it's not CBSA. It's, it's just the guards. From Toronto West, I was released to my parents after six months of being at Toronto West. After the fact, I've done my jail time, but I was held under administration by CBSA. Now, once I was released, I want to point out that I had the document they provided to CBSA is that my parent, um, India did not have, India does not believe I'm an Indian national. They, had known, they had known this five months prior to me even going to Toronto West Detention. But they chose not to bring it up. They brought it up after six months, and I got that information by filing a, a, a privacy to information, access to, access to information request form. Now, once I was released, I started contacting different activists, different groups to get support. And now at this point, I have union support, Amnesty International, CCLA, Canadian Civil Liberties Association, unions all supporting me. I have to apply for a work permit, I have to apply for my license back, I have to apply for a social insurance card. Everything was a challenge. Work permit I should have got within three to nine weeks. Even though I'm born in Canada, I had to apply for work permit because it's part of my conditions. I had to file a mandamus application in front of court where the front of court has to give me a decision why they're not giving me a work permit or they give me a work permit. I got the work permit. Now, a social insurance card. Anyone that goes to service Ontario with a work permit should get a social insurance card right on the spot. They decided not to give me a social insurance card and they advised me that someone will give me a call in 10 to 15 business days. I contacted Thomas McClare's office in Montreal and within 10 to 12 days later, I got a social insurance card. Same with the driver license. I had to go in front of a judge, explain my situation and explain that I've been born in Canada, lived here my whole life. I need my license to work. Now, once all this has came across, I had, I had to get my conditions changed. One of my conditions on my release was that my parents, I had to reside with my parents, where I, never, I haven't lived since I was 12 years old. I became crown ward 
state property at age 13. Now, I went for a detention review, and the, the adjudicator, seeing that I had a charter application in, in front, of, in front of court, of violation of subsection 6 and subsection 7, as well as a, a UN application through Canadian Civil Liberty Association on violation of international law, reduction of statelessness. These are two applications that are filed at this point. I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to end up by closing that. I'm seeking, I'm doing a speaking tour essentially to seek support. I'm looking for endorsements. I'm asking for financial support. I'm asking for pictures of, of solidarity support, and I'm always spreading the word. I always encourage everyone to look at my YouTube channels, um, Facebook, Twitter, my website, saw my uh, petition, and just spread the word. And. I'll, I'll end up by closing by saying thank you for coming out and feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, you talked to me about uh, uh, privacy being violated. So I want uh, you to uh, tell me, like, uh, uh, what was, uh, what, uh, how exactly your privacy was violated? Like, were your phone calls tapped? Or, uh, okay, when I say privacy was violated, the guard went out of his way to contact a completely different, organiza different organization. That's direct. Why would this organization contact a different organization to check up on me? That's what I mean by direct violation of privacy. Otherwise, there was no like spying or phone calls being tapped. To the best of my knowledge, no. But all calls are recorded anyway in jail. Okay, but not when you were out. Since I've been out, it's hard to tell. I I, I personally can't answer. I'm not, I'm not too sure if they have my phone tires phone <coughs> tapped or not. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that uh, even though you were born in Ottawa, that uh, the government alleged that your parents had, uh, or that you had diplomatic status, or your parents had diplomatic status, which is the reason why you didn't have citizenship. Is that could you elaborate on that a little bit more, yeah. just about uh, why they would allege that, or what circumstances gave rise to that thing? Okay, so my parents came here essentially as slaves, working for the High Commission. So when they came here, any, any employee of the High Commission, or anyone that comes with the High Commission has diplomatic privileges. They had diplomatic privileges until June 12th. I was born in October. They no longer work for the High Commission as June 12th. They work for a Pacific doctor, Canadian citizen. And have my passport, have a birth certificate, have a Canadian passport, but yet, when I got in trouble with the law, they decided to say that they gave me a passport in there, and I'm, no longer, I'm not considered a citizen, I'm considered a long-term permanent resident at that point, based on the fact that they believe, they bring in the fact that my parents had diplomatic status, and therefore, I'm not automatically entitled to have citizenship. It's the only exemption in the citizenship act. based on the fact that they're violating international law. One is reduction of statelessness of 1961. Also the fact that they induced me to become stateless. And I don't remember, I don't recall exactly the third, the third policy that they violate. So these are three policies that are violated under international law. And bring them to the Human Rights Committee so they can deem that Canada is violating something they have signed on in 1961. For the, for the charter application, Charter application is a direct violation of subsection 6 and subsection 7. I'm not going to go into detail of it, just leave it at that, 6 and 7. And it's basically seeking that the federal government declare that a citizen and seek declaration. Time frame for the UN, I've been told, is nine months. For the charter application, approximately six to nine months away before everything's all settled. At the, at the federal court level, then if I win, they can go to take an appeal. If I lose, I can appeal and process continue on. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank you.
just um, just a note that um, Nikan's case is also um, against the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and just six and section six and seven have to do with mobility of citizens and life, liberty, and security of persons in the charter. So, what is your status presently? Are you considered an undesirable? Un 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 you, you are a Canadian citizen and you have proof. So obviously, you know, your rights have been violated. If you have not had proper legal counsel, to, if there is proof that you are a Canadian citizen, then, you know, you, of course, you've been charged with certain violations, but you're still a Canadian citizen. So, you know, that should count for something else. So what is your status? Are you considered an undesirable? Uh, My status is that I have a deportation order as pending, which they cannot deport me. And I'm classified as stateless. As? Stateless. Non status and non grata? I have no status whatsoever. I'm just completely stateless. Every concept, like work permits, uh, passport, or work permit, travel, and everything. a lot of things are restricted. Are restrictions? That, uh, that was the concept of your question, or that's yeah. what that's what this case is about. For the government to recognize the citizenship here in Kansas, because they're denying the citizenship. So for the government to recognize it, it's the first case like that. Period. They, you said they can't deport you simply because India won't issue you any paperwork. They won't take you back. Like that. The former high commissioner of my town, that my parents were employed to, yeah. has wrote a letter to the effect that my parents did not work for him in any capacity in June 12. Right. So he had no, did not work for the high commission in any capacity. The Indian high commission clearly states that I'm not Indian national right. and will not issue me no documents. Right. And India itself has clearly stated that I'm not an Indian national and I just no documents. Right. So they can never deport but me Where back. are they going to send, yeah, where would they, where what, where's the plane going to go? Yeah. They're, they're not going to pull me up, they're going to keep me in right. limbo. And just, it's, it's the type where there's, I believe that they're just testing the waters to see if they can take away someone's status as born in Canada this and open the up the first time. The you're first the, time. You're the test case. That's right. I'm going to scapegoat essentially. Yeah. about um, um, speaking out, um, and you sort of said that it was absolutely essential, so can, can, you, can you talk about that? Because a lot of people who are in similar situations, whether it's double punishment or in your case triple punishment, are wary to speak out because it means talking about your, your private life and what have you. So can you talk about that? Because you've been very, very public yep. with your case sure. and your campaign. And then I have a question for Alex. In my opinion, when you deal with immigration or any RCMP, police officer, CIC, civil immigration, you're fighting any of, any of those agencies. I always encourage people to fight back. Don't let the government, don't let the state try to bully you to not fighting back. Fight back. If you know your rights are being violated, you know that this is wrong, and you feel that they're taking advantage of you, don't step down. Fight back. I always encourage individuals to always fight back. So. I, I was going through the chronology of events on the website. So what I want to understand is that once your parents terminated employment with the High Commission, yes. and your birth happened after, right? Yes. But they applied for permanent residency for all three, i.e. your parents and yourself, That's right. subsequent. So my question is, if you were born in Canada, why did they feel the need to apply for permanent residence? Because by nature of you being born here, you would be a citizen, right, by birth. And secondly, subsequently when they applied for citizenship for themselves, they did not apply for citizenship for you, even though they'd applied for permanent residency for all three of you. So why did that happen? Both in terms of applying for all three for permanent residence, but subsequently only applying for two for citizenship. Okay, one, they didn't have the education of speaking English, so a third party filled it up for them. They, they only went to the record clearly stating that they didn't speak English. They did not understand English, so they had a third party fill it up for them. So the third party wouldn't fill up the permanent residency application. That's, that, that document essentially has been thrown up because it doesn't hold any weight anymore. Because the, the basis of the fact that my parents didn't have knowledge of what they're signing, they're signing because they want to stay in Canada, and they only had a work permit. 
So you're putting you put in a situation where you get deported or you sign a document. What would you do? That's for the permanent residence. For the permanent for the citizenship aspect, they're only gonna apply for them and themselves because I'm born in Canada. Why would they apply for me? That's my question because then it kind of re it works as reverse logic that well, when they were applying for citizenship, they were time, more they went to school, they got they got to know how to speak English, and so forth. So, so they so were they more aware in terms of your having been exactly. born here, you're a, you're a citizen by birth. Okay. I just I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to clarify something. I think people are confused here about uh, the status of being a diplomat. When you're a diplomat uh, and or, or have a status of diplomat and you're born here, you, you, you are not uh, granted a citizenship. No, if you're working yeah. in an embassy or a high commission yeah. at that time, you're in the territory of that country, yeah. right? Yeah. So you would not be given citizenship by birth. But what he's saying is that he was born outside when his parents were not That's in employment correct, anymore. Yes. So by nature of him being born on Canadian soil, he should have been granted citizenship at birth. So that's my question. Yeah, that's what I, I was going to say. Yeah. He, he wasn't at the diplomat so status, but they're like they're playing with the. Facts. My only question is that yeah. why did the parents feel the need to apply for permanent residence when by birth he had citizenship, which he answers saying that they weren't aware. So that's my answer. Uh, there was another question back there. Maybe in Weba's case, your case, many cases that we hear about, there is this kind of limbo time that you're stuck waiting, um, and that's often something that happens with Canadian immigration policy. I'm just wondering if you could just let people know what that's like, just being in that space and not knowing what's going to happen. Okay, so once I was released from uh, Toronto West, not having no status, I was like, wow, I'm born in Canada, they have stripped away my citizenship, and I'm completely limbo. About a month after I was released, I can say that I'm, I'm, I was classified as stateless. Anyone who wouldn't accept me, now I'm stateless. Living in limbo where I don't have health care, I can't do normal things, I can't travel outside the country, a lot of restrictions, and, and knowing now that this can go on for five, seven, eight more years, and I still have to report to CBSA not to the highest level every month. Say I lose at the, at the Supreme Court level, I will deal with this for now. I'll be 47 years old before I'll be eligible to get citizenship back if I lose at the highest level. That's, and I'm 24 years old now. That's the time frame. So, so not knowing and not having time, not having a time frame, like the criminal aspect, you know you do your time, you have a set day, you're going to be free. With immigration, there's no set time. Things can go on for a long period of time. Different submission can be put in, different things can happen where your application are delayed. The other side can put different submissions in where they ask for extensions, so forth and so forth. Everything's a long process. So one application should take five years, or that one application should take six months. It all depends on how much the government wants to go back, and depending on what's the backlog, and depending on what application. Mm -hmm. So having a sense of not knowing, it bothers, it's, it's stressful. Mm -hmm. I don't sleep well, I don't eat well, and I just work on my campaign, I work on my case, I work, now I can work, and that's it. No social life. You can't really have a social life, because you don't know what's exactly gonna happen. So you don't want to establish a social life, plus you're more focused on your life in limbo, so you just want to work on a campaign and try to get as much outreach, try to work on a campaign as much as possible, and that's dedicated to your life. It's like having a full-time job on top of another part-time job is your campaign, and then you got to work to make sure you can, so you can survive before you get thrown back in jail. I'm just wondering, like, if you're able to, like, if you allow yourself to, or if you're able to, like, think about uh, the future, like a future outside of this situation, and like no, what? Not at all. No, not at all. Not at all. This is directly my life right now. This, is, and I, I only think about my campaign, work on my case, and different yeah. strategies. Like the furthest you've gone is like work this shit out, and then we'll think about it. Kind That's of right. Way. Basically, yeah. work on my campaign, and then work on living, living costs, living so work, and yeah. my campaign, and just different strategies, different outreach. I think I always think about things. I'd be driving down the road and like. Oh, I can be doing this. I, I stop, I write down, right. and I talk to the committee and then right. try to move forward. Uh, yeah, it seems that uh, much of uh, your situation seems to hinge on uh, the authorities' definition of error. That's right. Um, have they been forthright and transparent as to how they came to that decision? And uh, 
um, which decision makers actually played a part. They haven't come forward on where to get the decision, essentially, but the process of this is actually being brought up in front of court as we speak. Where's On their decision of why they took away my passport, they simply got the administration error. That's their, yeah. that's their definition. But the how? Do, do you have anything? Uh, There's, no have any information? There's no they, how. They did this clearly state definition of administration error, and they don't, they don't want to define it any further. I'm in the process of filing an application to get more information, but that's taking some time. Well, and you didn't even know that India said that you weren't a citizen, right? It was through a Freedom but, of Information Act. Right. Yeah, they weren't told, like, the Canadian government knew that India had said that he found you, but not be reported back, and they didn't say anything. To they withheld that, that information from me. Yeah. And from my lawyer. And this actually one brought up again during the detention review for bail reduction of uh, my conditions. You had a question? Yeah. It's actually, it's not a question, but it's, it's a thought. Uh, let's let's say for the sake of argument, the Canadian authority made the mistake, genuine mistake, which I think it's not the case. But uh, the first thing came to my mind when I read about the case is, if they made an error and they came back 20 years later and say, they said we made an error, can't they just like take responsibility for their error? Because they, wrong, they, they ruined someone's life. Somebody was born here, and after 20 years, they said, oh, we made an error, bye. You know, like, it just it doesn't make sense. Right. Like, it's like a human thing to do. So just to remind people, um, before you leave, that you can please pick up postcards, sign the chance statement, put your name on the list, pick up information about other organizations supporting um, migrants and refugees who are being deported, that would be great. And thank you all for coming out. Um, really appreciate it.